welcome to another exciting edition of ESP Practical Lawyers Academy free webinar series. We are glad to join us today. So uh, my name is Chidima Agu and I'm a research and development associate at ESP Trainings Limited. At ESP, at ESP Trainings Limited, our mission is to expand the frontiers of continuous professional learning with courses and trainings across various areas of practice. We have tagged this webinar series to launch our webinar series as the at 1 p.m. Good morning, Melanie Tio. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. Okay. Thank you, sir. So um, this um, our launch our webinar series that's set to hold at 1 p.m. during lunch break. They will hold three times every week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. However, in order to accommodate our Muslim participants, the Friday webinars will hold at 11 a.m. And every session will provide the resources in easily accessible formats for everyone who's interested. Presently, our training on advanced negotiation for lawyers starts on the 29th to 31st of March, and it goes for just 100,000 naira. And the mechanics of private equity and venture capital is also another training, and it starts on the 23rd to 24th of March, and it goes for 15,000 naira. Um, if you have any, if you want, if you're interested in these trainings, please um, just let me know. I would also put the link where you can register in the chat box. So the topic of today's webinar is on termination of construction contracts, and some of the things that will be discussed today is um, contractual rights of parties. What happens if anything goes wrong? Termination, the last result on the project, um, non-contractual rights, standard and popular termination terms, default and material breach. How to terminate the right way, you know, legal defenses, termination risk remedies, uh, termination damages, COVID-19, and termination of contractual contract, and many more topics will be discussed today. If you have any questions while the webinar is ongoing, please type in the Q&A or raise your hand, and in due time, everything will be answered. It is with great delight I, uh, I introduce our speakers today. We have three beautiful, awesome speakers. Mr. Momo Kadiri, he's the managing partner of Michelle Simon. Um, thank you for joining us today. Ms. Tosin Adjose, she's the lead advisor at the Deal HQ Partners. Thank you for joining us today. And our learner too, Mr. Wale Akoni, he's the managing partner of um, the firm. He was conferred with the rank of senior advocate of Nigeria in 2006 and is recognized by the WHO's of the Holy Gal magazine, and um, he he does he his practice areas include litigation, dispute resolution, corporate, commercial compliance, taxation, corporate finance, banking, and securities. He is a notary public for Nigeria and has he has been approved by the Nigerian Securities Exchange Commission to carry out legal services in the Nigerian capital market. He has acted as the chairman of the High Court of Labor State Civil Procedure Rules Review Panel and committee chairman on judicial appointments and bench relations of the Nigerian Bar Association. Thank you, Melanie, too, for joining us today. Thank you for moderating Thank service. you very much. Thank you. Yes. Um, this, I, leave, this, I leave you to moderate the session. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chidima. Thank you. We can hear you. We can hear oh, you, Chidima. OK, OK, OK. Um, I would love Melanie to start to um, moderate the topic, sir. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone, and um, uh, I welcome all of us to this um, session. It's um, the way I try to call these things, the knowledge sharing sessions, and um, it's quite uh, a very, very interesting topic that we are dealing with today, um, termination of construction contracts. This is an area that a lot of us find very interesting and fascinating because it's there's so much happening around the world and even in Nigeria today on construction in different forms and facets. There's road construction, building construction. I mean, there's so much happening uh, around and there is obviously a lot of scope for disputes um, in, in all these areas. So, um, I, I welcome everyone to this session. Um, particularly, I want to welcome our 
speakers. Um, we have to say, just say um, the lead advisor, um, DLHQ partners, and um, Momo Kajiri, managing partner of Michelle Simmons. These are two legal practitioners who I know have a wealth of experience in um, contractual obligations between parties, and um, we're going to learn a lot from them. Um, my role is very simple. I'm supposed to moderate the session. So I'm just going to, to sit down here and try to learn myself because um, there's so much to be discussed. Um, the, the issues that are, that are on the table are very, very substantial. And um, it's important that we, we find ourselves in, um, into a rhythm that will let us understand the legal issues that come up when we're discussing termination of contractual arena between parties in, in this area. So I'm going to start off. I, I think the way we, we should start is to allow the, the two speakers to at least um, give us their overview of the topic. And then, and then we can now start to delve into specific areas there. Um, this is a this is a period for women, so I'm I'm going to start with the lady first of all, and I would I would ask um, um, Ms. Ajose to please start. Give very us very the... very very <laughs> gracious of you, sir. Very very gracious indeed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you okay. Good morning. Good morning, Momo. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. So um, it's a very interesting time. I think I think you're muted. You, you, oh, you, you're in, oh, uh, I'm uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. So I was saying it's an interesting time to be talking about um, construction contract and termination, especially in the light of um, what the world saw in the last um, in the last um, one year and um, how COVID nineteen dealt, um, especially with the construction sector. And so um, there's been a lot of conversations around the impact of, you know, the pandemic, the lockdown, the um, economy in certain, the impact of, you know, the, 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 of COVID-19 on the economy of uh, many countries in the world and how all of these has impacted the rights of parties under construction contracts. So I'll just, you know, generally um, highlight a few things. Um, the first thing is that, um, um, termination is one of the most complex but most important elements of contracting generally, and even more so when you're talking about construction. And the reason why it is particularly you know, important in construction contracts is because one, the complexity of construction contracts. All of us know that you know, they are not our regular um, one party or rather two parties allocation of responsibilities type contracts. Usually they are very complex. You have multiple parties, you have multiple elements you know, to the contracts. The other thing is that there are usually several um, parties tied intricately together. So you will find yourself having the employer or sometimes the owner. You would find yourself having you know, the, con the construction contractor. Many times you will have several, several, several um, subcontractors in the mix. You may also have financiers in the mix. Sometimes you would have a set of financiers for the owner or the employer, and you would have another set of financiers for the construction contractor, and even sometimes um, financiers for each of the subcontractors. Other times you may have off takers in the mix, and sometimes you also have the users. So for instance, if it's a road you know, construction contract, you have the ultimate users of um, of the assets when it is completed. So, I mean, it's intricately linked together several stakeholders and parties. Um, we also know that um, construction is, um, is, is, um, is, is very heavy in terms of costs. So there has to be you know, cost considerations when you're thinking about termination. And then of course, you know, severe consequences um, of termination when you are dealing a construction contract. And finally, one of the things that is often said in construction is that delay is costly. There is a cost to every second 
that um, you know the the construction contract is um, is um, extended. So um, that that means that whenever we are considering construction contracts, we have to pay double the effort or double the attention to um, termination clauses, just for the um, several reasons that I have mentioned. So termination typically is a formal process of um, ending a contractual relationship and eliminating the obligations that the parties have to each other. And um, typically, when do you, you know, look to terminate a contract? There are three major areas that, um, or major things that would um, bring, would typically bring um, a contract to a place of termination. One will be upon completion of performance or the obligations of the parties to each other, which lawyers will sometimes call a fluxion of time. Very complex words. I don't know where we even get these things from sometimes. And then we have um, termination by the employer or the owner. And then we have termination by the contractor, as the case may be. So, I mean, typically people, people want to terminate a contract um, when they are not happy with the way, you know, things are going. Um, and sometimes they want to terminate a contract because, you know, there is no way forward. Something has happened, an event has occurred that makes it impossible for the contract to proceed or for one party to continue to perform its obligations under the contract. So typically, um, we, we talk termination where, one, there's a breach of contract. We also talk termination when the contract has been frustrated, meaning that the possibility of performance of one party or both parties' obligations has been impaired by the occurrence of a particular circumstance. And then sometimes, just for basis of um, on basis of convenience, one party just feels like, look, I don't want to continue. And you know, those are the three main uh, main um, elements or the main um, reasons why people choose to terminate um, construction contracts, or rather terminate contracts generally. So what, what th there's a, there should be a higher threshold of, um, of thought that goes into um, termination of construction contracts for the reasons that I had articulated earlier. And so I would say that when you are talking you know, termination, before you even enter or sign the dotted lines on that construction contract, it is important for you to ensure that you have thought through you know, um, termination and how you want that to happen under the contract. I mean, many times we would say that in construction, termination typically must be last resort. It must necessarily be last resort. And I'd explain you know, the reason why termination needs to be last resort. But for now, let me just talk about um, why it's important for the termination clause in the construction contract to be carefully thought out. And not only carefully thought out, it must also be carefully documented. And it must you know, have you know, very clear terms. There must be clarity as to all the intentions of the parties in relation to how things will pan out if indeed there is a reason for the parties or one of the parties to want to terminate. So first and foremost, in drafting the contract, it's important that we ensure that it reflects the intentions of the parties. It is important that we ensure that whatever we are drafting in does not compromise the project. So whether you know, the parties are choosing to extinguish their obligations or not, you must ensure that you preserve the capacity of the project to be completed. We must also ensure that the, the drafting of the termination contract minimizes uncertainty. So it should be clear exactly what the intentions of the parties are. And that intention must be documented clearly and unambiguously. I think it's also important that the termination clause allows for a tidy severance. So each party should be able to leave the table without any misgivings, without any you know, further obligations to each other or any rights that one party may have you know, against the other. And it's also very, very important because many times we forget to ensure that consideration is given to the underlying contracts, other underlying contracts or interest of other stakeholders. 
And when I say on the line contract, I mean not the main construction contract. Sometimes the arrangements between subcontractors and the, con the construction contractor, and at other times, maybe the relationships, maybe the contracts between the financiers and the party that is being financed. And I mean, many of you who have dealt on construction contracts will know that typically you would have the banks asking for direct agreement with a counterparty on the transaction because they just want to be sure that if the parties decide to go down the road of termination, a party who doesn't have any privity to them has to also give consideration to their own rights under that arrangement. And then last but not the least, you have another, you know, another constituency of people. So for instance, in real estate and maybe residential real estate, there are many times that you have off-takers and off-takers have um, construct contractual arrangements with um, maybe the employer or the owner. You have to ensure that their rights are also taken into consideration when you are thinking through the termination arrangement for your contract. Like I said before, termination typically is a last resort. And usually you don't want to be talking termination unless the incidence that is triggering the termination goes to the actual root of the contract or the relationship between the key parties to the construction contract has become severely irreparable. And this is the reason why you would find that many times when you use um, the standard form construction contracts, I mean, some of us you know, use um, the FedEx suit of contracts, some of us use um, the JCT and the rest of them, you will notice that they have a very, very robust provision <laughs> and arrangement for dealing with disputes and for dealing with you know, circumstances that typically may lead to a termination. And they would usually have layers and layers of, of, of protective clauses that ensure that whatever can be settled and resolved is settled and resolved without compromising the project itself. So
you've gone Sorry, mute. I got I got disconnected there. Okay, all right. Okay. Yes, I, I got disconnected for a bit. Yes, yes. I, I said I said that it's become very apparent now that contract administration is the most critical part of the construction story, right? I mean, just like you were saying, because you have this very complex contract with many appendices and what what have you, the technical team will never be able to, you know, alongside what they are already doing on a day-to-day -day in the project, monitor efficiently the bit that has to do with ticking the boxes on those contracts on a day-to-day. -day. Even where you do have a project manager or, you know, employer's rep or whatever, many times it's important for us to understand that, I mean, the, the, the more, the more, the more compliant and more sophisticated uh, projects these days are having, you know, a specific, you know, a more, a different, you know, team of people with different skill sets to actually administer the contract on a day-to-day -day so that you minimize, you know, the possibility of you being in, in breach of the contract. Because many times, you know, all of these things just get forgotten. The technical team just wants to see the project go ahead. Yes, and absolutely. most times they are having their, their, their meetings on site and they are forgetting to go back to look at what the contract actually stipulates. That, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tosin. It's, um, it's very, very, um, very, very important aspect of this whole um, discourse. Now, I want us to look at an area. The uh, and I think this is directed at you. First of all, you raised the issue of the fact that there are several parties involved in this contractual issues, and termination has its effect on all of them. They're the owners and the developers on the one hand. They're the financiers on the other hand. And then they're the professionals, the technical people on, on another hand. Everybody has their own different kinds of arrangements and contracts, which build into the entire contractual structure for the project. But where the termination or the principal dispute is between the owners and the contractor and it leads to a termination how does it affect the financiers and the professionals and i would like us to please if you have real life examples please assist us with them this is for you to say okay um I, I i think that yes okay yes i don't know if you can hear me yes yes we, we can can you hear me Yes, we can hear you. I can. Hello. Oh, yes. OK. OK. So I mean, like, like I mentioned, OK, right. So like I mentioned, in, in, many, in many construction uh, projects, there is the main contract, which is the construction contract, especially when you have a main contractor. But like Ron said, there are several other contractors and the employer is the, is the construction contract. Sometimes you have several contracts between the subcontractors and the main contractor. Sometimes you may have up to, up to 20, 30 people who have been delegated different scope of work under the main you know, scope of the contract. Now, what I think is most important is wherever you fall, whether you are a lender, whether you are a subcontractor, it's always important for you to have a clear understanding of the obligations of the main contractor. Or if you're a financier, which is even easier, many times, no matter what side the lender falls on, they are very interested in knowing, you know, the key terms of the main contract. And some other times they even want to have a relationship with the counterparty, especially if you are financing the construction contractor and not you know, the owner or the employer, right? You know that your contract immediately becomes at risk if there is you know, a dispute 
on the mini contract. So typically, I think I think the way to deal this is one to be very interested that you are linked to who is the party to the main contract, and so you are also monitoring. You are monitoring, you know, performance on that leg. And I think also understanding that the rights that you have are subordinated to the rights once there is a trigger of, you know, dispute or termination on that main contract, it automatically affects yours. So how have you, you know, ring fenced yourself or protected your, yourself from that risk in the event that it does happen? Mostly, if you are if you are another if you are if you if you are lender, for instance, you just want to ensure that you know if the project cannot go on, that you are able to make a claim for your money, or maybe it will trigger you know a it will trigger a, a breach on your own you know um, on your own financing um, um, contract, and then you can call the facility. If you do call the facility, what happens? Do you take security? Did you, so, I mean, point is, there's no, I cannot say that this is the way to protect yourself, but it will always be specific to it. But most importantly, just to ensure that, you know, you have an understanding that, you know, there could be a trigger for, you know, termination under your own contract where anything goes wrong with the main, with the main contract and ensure that, you know, you have, you know, work with lawyers that can, you know, ensure that you are sufficiently protected and that if there is a termination on the, on the main contract that under your own arrangement, it can also trigger a termination or if there is, if it doesn't warrant, you know, triggering a termination that at least you are put in good stead. Okay, thank you very much, um, Tosin. It's um, So very... I, I hope you heard me. Well, it, it, it was breaking off at the end. Okay, great. It was breaking. It was breaking off at the end, but I think we heard most of it. I, I want to turn to to Momo now. We've talked. We've talked about um, um, termination being the last resort. There are. So the question is, how do you? What's the right way to terminate? And then there are all these issues about the in the in the in the contracts, the notice and cure opportunities that are in the, in the contract. How best does any party use these opportunities to at least to mitigate the incidents of termination and all that? So I'm asking a double barrier question. What's the best way to terminate? What's the right time to terminate? And then how do you explore and um, use the notice and cure opportunities in the, in the contract? Uh, thank you, Lenesio. Um, I think that um, like we've already identified from the very opening remarks that uh, Tosin and myself, and I think even yourself alluded to, was the fact that termination is a very serious uh, uh, issue. And of course, does raise quite significant consequences as well. So the question is, um, how does a party uh, in a construction and perhaps project engineering contract, how, how do they go about um, seeking to terminate? Um, like I mentioned before, it's always very important that the party seeking to terminate crosses um, uh, the T's and it dots the I's to make sure that it's in a good position to be able to advance that um, claim on the basis that what the other party has done is such that the innocent party is not able to carry on. Now, there will be contractual provisions, obviously, that pro, uh, you know, provide for what the parties can do. Clearly, like you referred to, um, being able to set the notice and asking for the other party that is in breach or that is alleged to be in breach to remedy the situation or to cure the defect and what have you. Now, clearly, uh, the employer, and like you mentioned, there are other counterparts, there could be other, the other parties as well. Now, clearly, from the employer's point of view, they, 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 are, they, want, they, they engage the contractor in the first place 
because they wanted to deliver the project on budget and on time. Now, if they are concerned that any critical park or milestones are now not going to be met or have already not been met, clearly they will be keen to see how they can terminate that contract once they have served the relevant notices and they are still not satisfied with the way that the contractor is going on with the project. Now, clearly this is an area that can always be very problematic because the, 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 contract, the, the employer can look at the contract and see clearly that they have served their notice and indeed they can also from their own point of view see that their concerns have not been satisfactorily addressed. Now, of course, whereas they would think that that is a good place to be, to be able to terminate, the reality, like I mentioned, is that you also have to be able to envisage any countervailing arguments that the uh, contractor in this instance is going to make and be able to anticipate them and prepare for them and in fact, in the process of serving notices, you need to be able to be drawing the attention of the contractor to those issues. And the notices and the requests for um, any remedy to be made have to be you know, quite um, expressive in terms of highlighting what it is that's been done wrong, what is it that, uh, uh, that the contractor should have done, and any time limits for which do you expect them to um, remedy the situation? So all of that, I think, is very key. Once the, uh, the owner is in a position where they satisfy themselves that all the relevant notices, both under the contract, as well as any other applicable uh, law, for example, maybe under the governing law, have been served, and that, most importantly, that the the, the, the event that is being complained about that is giving rise to determination is such that it is fundamental um, in that it's not just enough, for example, that there's been delay on the part of the contractor, but the, the employer sometimes, I think, from experience will have to show that the delay is having an impact or is likely to have an impact on a critical part of the project so that um, when they are bringing their claim, they want to be able to demonstrate that it was not just a, a delay for a period that was not uh, so relevant, but that it was such that was uh, critical to the, to, the, to the delivery of the project in that it was already having an impact such that the contracted completion date was not going to be met. So I think those are some of the things that um, from an, uh, an employer's perspective um, need to be looked into. Now, of course, if it is clear that there are reasons why the, um, the contractor is not able to perform satisfactorily as far as the owner is concerned, again, that is something that needs to be made clear and perhaps the um, contractor be notified appropriately so I think generally speaking, um, it's always great to be able to prepare your case based on what you think you know or what the contract says, but also very crucially to be able to anticipate what the countervailing argument that the opponent is going to make and be able to address them robustly uh, from inception, including any uh, termination notice that is going to be issued. So that eventually, if the matter goes to arbitration or, or to the courts, it will be clear that, look, this is what transpired and that the um, uh, employer in this instance was entitled to terminate because all the T's had been crossed and the I's were dotted, both under the contract and as a matter of fact as well. Thank you very much, uh, Momo. Um, it's, it's interesting because you've also dovetailed into some of the um, further areas that I wanted to, to 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 bring up as well, and it's nice that we've all we've heard your your views on them because really I was going to deal with what are the things that can go wrong 
I mean, when you're terminating and um, you've, you've already um, pointed them out that you need to be prepared because uh, what are the defenses that the other side can come up with? So you need to be thinking about them when you are even coming up with your, with your arguments and then what, what are the risks that are, that are possible? So I, I would like to hear from, from Tusi's um, own perspective uh, her answer to this to, to these points. I mean, how do you terminate? What do you consider? What are the risks of it going wrong? And what are the the defenses that the other side can come up with? Because in, in terminating, you think that you are right and you've come up with everything, but you must also think about the other side. What are they possibly going to do? And how are you going to mitigate against those risks as you prepare to terminate and go along let us hear you please okay thank you sir so i i think first and foremost i must say that um i'm not typically a proponent for termination except where it's absolutely the only way out of um out of the situation and so i would start by saying for me priority point will be you know one the procurement process for selecting the the contractor or the party and if you are the contractor i think one other thing is for you to from the onset establish the capacity of the of the employer to pay or to meet their own obligations under the arrangement once you can establish from the onset this they have capacity to actually meet those um those obligations i think the 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 risk or potential for one for termination would you know significantly be reduced that's the i think that's the first thing i mean the other thing that would maybe necessarily you know lead to may necessarily lead to termination is frustration if a frustration event happens and typically what are these things that could be frustration events i think one will be getting approvals for the project um typically you want to be sure that you know before you are locked into the arrangement some of these things you have to take them off the box uh, so if you know, the ministry approvals are in place if the funding arrangement or the funding structure for the problem you know clearly on the design on you you want to also be sure that you know the design is is um, is fine and that you have you know um assessed on the merit that you know it's able to deliver the the expectation or the obligations of the employer and so i mean i'm not i'm not usually from that school of thought where you don't assume you know the design risk when you are you know um starting off the the project i think you know some of these very i mean seemingly um little things that we can you know deal with at the beginning would typically help us to narrow you know some of the things that could take us to um the point where we are we are considering termination i must say that in my practice i have never seen a situation where um we enter into the realm of termination on a on a construction project and it does not eventually lead to a dispute or um some form of um dispute resolution or whatever where you know then you are embroidered in some litigation somewhere or arbitral proceedings which at the end of which most of the time you will still come back to you know start um, trying to another thing i think will be to ensure that you know there are sufficient cure arrangements within the contract and any good and standard construction contract would make sufficient room and arrangement for cure for you know performance and um, um putting the party who has suffered you know consequence of um of any action in good stead financially so you would usually have a, reg a regime for payment of 
you know, liquidated damages as um, as compensation for things that may go wrong in the course of the in the course of the contracting. And really, if you are seeking to because one party has not done you know what they are supposed to do, in which case it will be a failure to um, complete. And the underlying implication will be that there will be either a cost overrun or there will be a time overrun. If it's, a, if it's a time overrun, at the end of the day, it's a monetary loss. If it's a cost overrun, it's also a monetary loss. So if there are arrangements within the contract that allow you to access you know, compensation for some of these uh, incidences that have happened, I think you know, it's, it's good you know, to ensure that um, you take the benefit of some of these things. But I mean, if you do find yourself in a situation where maybe it's a function of lack of competence of um, one party, or maybe in the case of the of, you know, way out, um, other than to explore possibilities for termination. And then of course, maybe if there is, if there has been a, a, a frustration or a force majeure event. So the first thing is, I mean, I, I teach courses in, in construction law and I know that one of the things that we typically say to people is in construction, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So whether you are the employer, whether you are the constructor, whether you are a subcontractor or you are um, a beneficial, um, you, are, you are a beneficial user at the end of the project. I mean, you must always come into these relationships knowing, you know, every single thing that will go wrong will go wrong. So for me, I mean, having you know a strong, you know, framework for risk uh, mitigation will be, you know, the ultimate way to to approach these things. Again, I have never seen a project that completed on time. So you have, I mean, you have a schedule for the project and you were able to run the course of that project based on the schedule and nothing went wrong. I have never seen one of such projects in my entire you know, time of practicing as a, as a lawyer, I have never seen. So everything that would go wrong, that can possibly go wrong will go wrong, but you must anticipate this year that you have you know, a strong, if you are, if you are working as the employer, ensure that you have a strong team that is liaising, you know, with um, the contractor and that is, you know, giving feedback. And because some of these things, if not escalate to the point where we're talking termination, and I mean, those are those are some of the things that I, I would say. So I'm not typically a proponent of of um, of termination, except where it is absolutely you know unavoidable or safeguarding you know the project and case. I think I think from the standpoint of the employer, it's absolutely important to be sure that you know whatever you do at that point, you are able. To control of the site to immediately, you know, um, put another construction contractor in the place and go can continue, you know, without without incidents. I think there there are some construction contracts where you actually want to draft in clauses that allow you to replace the the construction contractor with another one and get somebody else to assume you know the responsibilities for completing the projects and you'll find that if it's project finance and there are um, financiers in the mix they would always ensure that there are these kinds of arrangements they would have stepping rights they would have the right to nominate you know uh, a new construction contractor to take over the project completely if there's dispute between the contractor and um and um, the employer so that you know they can preserve the asset and ensure that you know they have a clear line of sight towards how they would um, um 
I, I think it's, it's unfortunate. We seem to have lost those things momentarily. Oh, really? Ah, okay. Yes, I think I think it's come back up now. It's come back up. Oh, but did you hear? Did you hear what I said? We heard oh, wow. the bulk of it. It was just the last, <laughs> last one or two sentences oh, that wow. faded away. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. So that's fine. That's fine. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, something I was going to leave till later. You've touched on it, and I would like to hear the views of Momo and probably yours briefly, I mean, just briefly before we go into something else. You talked about the um, arrangements for uh, maybe appointing a new contractor to go in on, onto the site and start to work towards completion and things like that. I want to hear from both of you, um, Momo, starting. Um, what has your experience been about the intervention of the courts in this area? I want to know, we, I mean, we're all in this country, we know how a lot of people have used the courts to intervene in contractual issues in such a manner that have disrupted things. And I just wonder uh, how has been your experience in, for instance, courts granting injunctions to stop the continuation of a project because a, a, a contractor has been terminated and he feels the termination was wrongful and he, he goes to court and he knows that they're about to appoint a new contractor to go onto site. So he jumps in and goes to court to get an injunction. What, what has been your experience about this? Has this happened regularly or is it something that doesn't really happen? Thank you, Lennon. Okay. Uh, I think because um, primarily, uh, a sort of a UK uh, and international practitioner, I think I'll probably give my perspective more from uh, my experience uh, in the UK. Um, of course, I can also speak uh, briefly about Nigeria as well, but I think the key thing, first of all, is that first thing to say is that uh, generally speaking, the courts do not make contracts or bargains for parties. So, um, I think the first thing is, like I think Tosin mentioned, is to make sure that the contract is robustly drafted to deal with any possible scenario, including claims as well as termination provisions. Now, uh, so long as those uh, provisions are robustly you know, drafted and the parties follow what they say, I think the attitude of the English court generally will be to uh, not necessarily be, want to be seen to be uh, making commercial bargains for the parties. Rather, we'll be trying to ensure that whatever the parties have agreed, whatever deal they have struck, they are able to uh, carry it out, including uh, in relation to uh, construction contracts. Now, um, in terms of um, injunctions or trying to have court intervention. I think my experience has been that clearly if the dispute resolution provision in the contract provides for um, arbitration, for example, then I think um, except there are specific urgent uh, necessities, Generally speaking, what you will find is that those disputes will have to be arbitrated. Now, in cases of, like you're saying, maybe a new uh, contractor is about to be engaged and the existing contractor is apprehensive about that, of course, they'll be entitled to approach the court. Now, ultimately, the question will have to be, uh, for example, uh, has the party that is allegedly the innocent party have they complied with what the agreement says in terms of serving notices? For example, again, like I alluded, if you are serving notice as an employer on the, on the contractor, of course, the contractor would say, for example, that there has been prevention or there has been variation, the scope of work has changed and all of that. And because of that, that is the reason for the delay and that um, the um, employer is actually liable 
uh, partly for the reason for the delay. So these are all factual as well as legal uh, uh, issues that obviously an aggrieved uh, contractor will want to approach the court. But my general take is that if the agreement provides for uh, um, arbitration, which in most large scale uh, uh, construction and engineering projects do provide for, I, I think it'll be, it will be that whereas they may get an injunction temporarily, I, but I think in terms of if the agreement provides for arbitration, generally speaking, they will have to arbitrate uh, the dispute eventually. Um, in terms of other remedies that you could try and get from the courts, in my own experience, uh, again, uh, the, the attitude of English court when it comes to questions like specific performance, for example, right? Because clearly, if uh, uh, the owner is now seeking to bring in another uh, uh, or engage another contractor, clearly, and the, uh, the, the existing contractor is resisting that, then clearly the, the existing contractor is basically almost asking the court for specific performance that look, I want to be allowed to, you know, maybe remedy the issue or, or, or finish the project or the actual contractor that is liable for the delay, but it's actually the, the employer. So generally you find that that is almost like the existing contractor is almost asking for specific performance. Now, the, the attitude of English courts in that regard is quite interesting because whereas the English courts would generally be happy to grant um, um, specific performance, for example, of a contract, uh, I think for, um, for construction-related contract, the attitude of the court has been a bit uh, hesitant, especially if um, they are not able to uh, enforce uh, the day-to-day performance of those obligations in the contract. Uh, but generally speaking, there are certain yardsticks. If those criteria, and I believe there are three of them, uh, if those yardsticks are met, generally speaking, the court will be able to say, look, you know what? We will grant uh, uh, an injunction and uh, potentially um, if it's a project, maybe particularly if it's already relatively uh, at an end, um, perhaps that could be uh, an argument that the existing contractor could put forward as well. But generally speaking, I think in terms of um, 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 the contracts, as well as the common law position, is that yes, the contracts will bind the parties as far as their rights and obligations are concerned. But clearly, um, I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of is that it's not just the contract itself that becomes applicable really when there's a dispute or when there's termination, for example, the governing law becomes also applicable. So if a party has, say for example, other Nigerian law, um, an inherent right to be able to bring a claim uh, in the courts to enforce their contractual uh, entitlement, for example, even if the, um, uh, the employer is not seeking to bring in um, another contractor for good or bad reason. Uh, of course, I can understand why um, the, the existing contractor will want to get an injunction against the employer. Whether or not they will succeed ultimately in preventing the employer from uh, getting in, uh, uh, or engaging a new uh, contractor will obviously be down to the facts of the case and the circumstances. Thank you very much, Momo. Can, can we quickly hear to see your perspective on this from a Nigerian uh, practitioner's yeah. point of so, view? So, so generally speaking, I think I agree with um, what uh, Momo has said, but um, the Nigerian environment um, seems to usually be another kettle of fish from what you see, you know, um, applies in most other jurisdictions. The extent of abuse of, um, of courts especially in contractual relationships between parties, even when, you know, you have, as Momo mentioned, majority of, um, of um, construction contracts will typically, you know, tend towards arbitration as a means of um, dispute resolution. In fact, I haven't seen anyone that um, will not, um, you know, utilize uh, maybe the internal mechanisms for dispute resolution that is set out by the, by the, by the body um, if you are using a standard form contract, and in any case, ultimately arbitration. Um, but even, even at that, you find yourself in an environment where people are very hasty 
to try to, you know, use the um, principalities of the courts to try to, um, you know, to hold off parties from being able to, um, from being able to enforce, you know, certain rights or privileges that they may have, you know, under the contract. And this has become, you know, increasingly, you know, made it increasingly difficult for, for parties to um, effectively implement um, some of the um, protective provisions that they may have in their contract. And more and more, we're seeing that for people that have high value um, um, projects, they are very, very concerned around, you know, things around um, jurisdiction, things around, um, you know, arbitration, the, 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 the forum law and um, the place of arbitration, because people generally have, you know, um, um, concerns around, okay, there is a dispute. I mean, how do we ensure that, you know, those disputes are, are able to be resolved without um, people using the instrumentality of um, the law court to um, derail, you know, the internal processes that have been set up in the in the construction contract for how those issues um, for how those issues um, will be will be resolved. So I think it's still it's still um, a major um, area of concern for us. But I think majorly what people do is you just draft as much as possible, you know, those provisions of the contract in the way that gives you, you know, the most comfort. And this is why, again, we see a lot of situations where people are selecting, you know, um, how arbitrators will be, I mean, putting into the contract, how arbitrators will be selected. And many times it's not in favor of um, local content. People are, you know, picking, um, you know, um, jurisdictions for, for settlement of disputes. Sometimes, you know, you will find that it's not in, it's not in um, in favor of um, local content and and I mean so it's it's typically in response to some of these things. Even in some cases, people at certain level of projects do not want to deal with Nigerian construction contractors. They are looking for those that have you know international standard practice. They are looking for people that understand you know the implications of you know things going wrong on a project and that would be willing and able to, you know, follow through the internal mechanisms um, for, for, for resolution of, um, of, of these disputes. And typically you would know that you would, I, I should note that um, when, when, um, when intervening in construction contracts, a lot of the times people that have expertise in, um, in, arbitrating um, construction um, contract, you will know that their focus is usually on preserving the project, much more than anything else. Preserving the project and ensuring that even whilst disputes are ongoing and are yet to be resolved, that you know, work can continue because they understand the implications of not allowing work to continue and then delaying projects and then there is no clear end in sight for when you know this um, this 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 project will be completed. So if there is a certain element of the of the of the project that has um, triggered a dispute, nonetheless, while parties are trying to resolve these disputes, the project would usually continue. I mean, I've worked on construction projects where maybe there may be one or two arbitration cases, you know, in different parts of the world on the project and the contractor is still on site. And work is still going on. You know, it doesn't mean that you know they're not um, fighting one thing or the other. There may be disputes around um, around um, 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 damages that are due on certain parts of the work, or one element or one part of the work is you know is being disputed. But you are still able to continue, you know, on the on the project generally because it's very very essential to ensure that you know there is a clear line of sight to completion of 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 works. Thank you very, very much. Um, it's, it's really um, nice to hear this because you see, we, we, I, I, I like to engage into, into things of this nature so that we can all learn. Now, we, we're drawing to, to the close of this, but there's no way we can have a, a, a purposeful discussion on termination of contracts without talking about what has happened to the world in the last one year. Um, yesterday was one year anniversary of the WHO officially declaring this COVID-19 a pandemic. 
And um, um, we all know what has happened over the last 12 months. Basically, the whole world has almost ground to, to a halt. And we know how, we want to know how it has affected the construction industry, construction contracts in particular. Now, it's, we're going to discuss three things together. Basically, the effect of COVID-19 on contractual obligations. Is it force majeure? Is it, are we able to lift it up to the level of frustration? I mean, how has it affected contracts? Has it led to a lot of terminations? Has it led to a lot of breaches? I mean, I'm practically too, because I would like to hear some practical um, um, insertions in here. What has been the experience like in Nigeria? I, I am pretty familiar with what has happened in Dubai because um, I, I have a bit of work that we're doing around that area. But what, what has happened in Nigeria? Um, how has COVID-19, the pandemic, how has it affected us? How has it led to termination? Is it, are we able to, is it force majeure? Is it frustration? Is it just a regular breach? Or is it just a matter of delay? That can be dealt with in the agreement and things like that. I'd like to hear your perspectives. No more first. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you again, Lena Um, I think this question is not only related to or relevant to the uh, construction industry. I think it's pretty much even as individuals in our private lives, you know, our business lives, we've all been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, but specific to the question. Uh, in terms of uh, whether the incidents uh, of COVID-19 uh, amount to uh, first measure or frustration. I think the first thing first is that uh, it really, you have to look at the contract really, first of all, because I've done a few cases where there have been instances where uh, a party is claiming first measure but you find out that the contract itself does not cover that particular uh, specific event that is alleged to amount to force majeure. So the first thing first I will say is that um, I think my understanding is that whereas many contracts, particularly in the construction uh, or including in the construction uh, industry may not have uh, adequate provision to uh, cover specifically first majeure, um, sorry, not first majeure, COVID-19 or pandemic, specifically speaking, uh, as a first majeure event, I think obviously one of the learning curves is that many contracts are now being uh, amended. And like Tosin said, it's very difficult sometimes to find a contract that starts uh, from day one and ends on the very day that uh, it was stated to uh, or expected to end. Generally speaking, what you find is that there will be variations and there'll be extension of time between the contractor and the employer being agreed from time to time. So whether um, an event and indeed specifically COVID-19 amounts to a first major event um, would have to be dependent on the wording and the definition of um, events under the contract, whether that includes uh, uh, the pandemic. So that, that would be the answer to that. In terms of frustration, um, again, yes, some projects, I think, I don't think many projects uh, to my knowledge have been frustrated. What I think has happened, because when you're talking about frustration, essentially you're saying that look, uh, the project uh, due to no fault of either party is now at an end. Um, I don't really think, or I'm not aware of uh, many projects in as much as many other businesses have been affected. In terms of the construction industry, uh, especially in Nigeria, for example, Niger Delta again, where uh, I'm aware of a few projects. What has happened is that uh, there's been delay and invariably that has now led to extension of time. Those delay, for example, a few state governments like Delta State and pretty much most states in Nigeria, I guess, they issued uh, uh, 
the gov the gov uh, the, 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 there were some orders that were issued stay at home orders that were issued by various state governments particularly for example in delta state where uh, i know of a client uh, that are doing business in uh, offshore niger delta there now what you find is that clearly that would that will be covered in any properly drafted and in most of the standard contracts for example if there are government restrictions uh, preventing movement or if there are uh, public uh, disorders and what have you, security concerns, for example, then I think generally what has happened is that um, the employer and the contractor have had to, you know, review the, the progress and taking into consideration what has happened. So there has been delay. Um, I'm not also aware or think that there are generally uh, COVID-19 should just now be a ground for termination, of, of course, except both parties agree that the contract is now um, uh, frustrated. So the last point that you mentioned, the delay, seems to me to be um, uh, a common trend. And I think the way that parties are addressing that is to appreciate the fact that the pandemic was not um, you know, uh, the fault of either of the parties. And obviously, clearly, they are now having to adjust the program to accommodate um, any delays uh, that has been uh, met. Also, um, implicit with that is a necessary price adjustment because clearly the contractor is not having to maintain their site and establishment costs and all the other related costs uh, because of the pandemic and the project now being extended. Clearly, they are, they are not having to sit down with the, uh, with the uh, owner to discuss and find amicable ways in which they can adjust the price in order to reflect any extended period of time due to the delay caused by the pandemic. So that's the way I, I see it at the moment. Thank you very much, Momo. Um, yes, let us move to to, to say quickly. Okay, um, I, I think I think it's <laughs> interesting times fell upon us, and I'll tell you a, a funny story about one of the projects that I was I was involved in. They did have a, a, a force major um, draft in the contract, which allowed either party to call a force major, and it actually named epidemic or pandemic, funny enough, in this contract. And then it, the contract also said that if the, if the force major event continues for more than 30 days, then either party has the right to suspend performance of the contract. In this particular situation, the the drafting was in favor of the employer um they were reaching the end of a particular milestone on the project where the um construction contractor would have been due some payments and then this i mean our 30 days was completed and a beautiful letter was written to the to the construction contractor to say that um, we are now you know giving you notice that um, this um, first major event has now continued for about 60 days and therefore you know we would like to you know exercise the right to suspend you know performance of um, the obligations that we have under this contract and here is a construction contractor that has got to you know the end of um, a particular milestone inching to you know make a demand for payment and you know the whole thing just goes quiet from that time you know and you can imagine they were offsite maybe for most projects had their teams offside for six months or more, you know, during the during the during the pandemic, and then subsequently we saw people gradually, you know, go back, and then shortly after the whole, you know, return to site, then we had the NSARS, and you know, people were, you know, off off work again for, you know, weeks and all of that. And I, I think the most the most interesting thing for me is. Even if you did have, you know, sufficient drafting in your contract for to 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 demand um, or rather to enforce, you know, a force majeure provision, I'm not sure whether you know that really serves the best interest of either party because the objective is you want, you know, this project completed. The objective of both parties will be to get this project completed on time, you know, and on budget. So, I mean, if you didn't have, if you didn't have, you know, a first major provision, you still have your common law, you know, um, protection for, for um, frustration. But I mean, I didn't, I, I don't think that that was the mindset of a lot of people in the construction industry, because really, 
if you call a frustration and then the contract terminates, I'm not sure that anybody stands, you know, to benefit anything. Um, the 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 more the, what, what we saw in the industry much more were people coming together to say, how do we take off from where we we all are and people, you know being open to have conversations. I mean, for contractors that had fixed cost contracts, all of us know how much, you know, the economic um, situation, you know, dealt, you know, blows to some of the assumptions that they had made on their projects. And for those of them that have FX exposures, we also know, you know, how that has impacted, you know, the eventual pricing. And I remember having a conversation once with somebody where we were, you know, um, having, you know, a debate as to whether, you know, the FX rate, the ballooning FX rate was a frustration on the project or was not frustration. And the guy was, you know, very unhappy with my own stance. I'm not going to say what my stance was here, but I mean, he was, he was looking, you know, intently at how, you know, he could, um, you know, um, establish the fact that, you know, the, the, the ballooning FX rate was, or, well, ballooning rate and in a, unavailability of FX was um, a frustration to the continuation of um, a construction project where he was um, where he was main contractor. But I mean, what I would say is it only makes sense that we stay on the path of the objectives of the project, which is the contractor is trying to ensure that he delivers a project to the expectation of um, of um, of the employer, and the employer is looking to complete, you know, projects. But more important for me is how have we dealt the issues around pricing? That has been a major, major concern for a lot of people that are, you know, in the construction space because you've seen projects go to, you know, um, three times the price that had. Um, that, that, that the project was priced at the time, you know, that, um, that this commenced. And this also has significant impact on even the, the, the framework for, um, for financing. A lot of lenders have had to have, you know, um, meetings with the parties to reprice facilities, to refinance and all of that. So the least that you want to be talking about is terminating a construction contract. You showed, I mean, a lot of people's, um, 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 their, their leaning has been towards how do we make this work? Even the banks, it has been how do we make this work? Because really, I mean, this is due to no fault of anybody, but it's, it, it is what it is. And, and projects have suffered. They have suffered um, consequences of um, time escalations. They have suffered consequences of monetary escalations. Some of them have seen, you know, project leads and a lot of the, the key people on the projects have to leave the country on account of COVID. And then, you know, many of them have not even come back up until now. So you have engineers leading projects that maybe are from another jurisdiction. So, I mean, there's so many elements, you know, that you can, I mean, that you can, you can, you, you can look at so many parameters. So teams have leaned, people have lost, you know, key men on projects, you know, and the most important thing is, you know, keeping the focus on allowing the project to continue. And I think this has been the, the, the trend that I have seen amongst all stakeholders, including the banks. They're having conversations. I've not seen any single one project where any bank has called a, a default and called their facility on a project because I mean, it, it just will be practically unrealistic. So that's-, that's Thank you what very I much. Thank you, thank you. Um, I- all I can say is to um, make the point that I'm not sure we could have had a better panel to discuss these issues with us. And um, I think the S uh, ASQ Practical Lawyers Academy webinar for today, um, this, we have shared a lot of knowledge and I believe that a lot of us have learned new things, but Got, gotten a better perspective or a different perspective of several things that were discussed here today. I want to uh, thank our panelists, uh, Momo and Tosin, for their insightful um, discussion here today. I will, um, in rounding up, all I just want to, I want to give them the, the last say just one minute each 
to just round up and just tell us what their parting shots are. If you have any practical tips you want to give to leave us with, one minute each, because we are at the end of it already. One minute each. And I will time it. <laughs> so I'll start with, um, I'll start with Tosi. Right. Um, so I, I think I think my 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 parting note will, would be to say that um, construction is very intrinsic to the development of any of any of any nation and any economy. So we must keep um, trying to inch better in the way that we practice um, construction law. For those of us that are lawyers in that space, we must ensure that we are deepening our knowledge and that we are guiding our um, clients and mitigating risks for them no matter what side you know, of the project they find themselves, whether they are financier or they are develop or developers or construction contractors or they are project owners or they are government regulators or whatever. So let's just keep deepening knowledge so that um, we have a more robust um, marketplace. And for those um, people that practice in the litigation space, please let us always keep our focus on being commercially minded. Um, Biz businesses just have to work. Let us stop putting, you know, um, limitations in the way of business people that are trying to do that are trying to do work. Let us just ensure that the marketplace is able to work and to function. Thank you very much, uh, Momo. Your parting words. Thank you again. Uh, my what I would say is that uh, uh, claims are real, uh, disputes are real, uh, no matter how. Uh, well intentioned and how hard parties try, the truth is there will always be inevitable that will happen. And for me, if there's any, any area of practice that I think is very fact sensitive, I think it's the construction and project engineering sector. Now, many claims are easy to assert, including even exercising the right to terminate. But being able to provide uh, what we generally refer to as substantiation is very key. And construction claims are mostly won and lost on the facts. So having the project team, as well as the legal team, being able to articulate um, a case that is not only robust in terms of what is being presented, but also very critically in being able to address any countervailing arguments from the other side, I think is very key. So those will be my, um, my parting words. Thank you very, very much. Um, I am indebted to um, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to moderate this event. I, I have learned a lot myself. Um, it's an area that I I do practicing as well, but again, knowledge is something that we must continue to 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 acquire. Um, thank you very much, um, Momo and Tosin, for sharing your knowledge with all of us. And um, I I wish all of you a very good day. I'll hand over back to Chidima to close the session. Thank you, my learned for today moderating this session. Thank you, Mrs. Tosin Adjose. Thank you, Mr. Momo Kadiri. It has really been an exciting session and we've really learned a lot. And we thank you for taking our time today, despite your busy schedule. And we look forward to having you on subsequent webinars. A very big thank you to our sponsors, Alex, GLIA, Sanko, Bloomfield Law Practice, and Advocate Law Practice for making this webinar possible today. Thank you also to all our attendees for participating in today's webinar. Please note that our next webinar series will be on Monday, 15th of March by 1 p.m. And the topic will be on digital skills for lawyers. You know, um, lawyers need to be digitally savvy in order to stay relevant. And this free webinar provides practical training on basic digital skills, including productivity and digital marketing skills for lawyers. So. Um, please, you can't afford to miss this particular webinar series coming up on Monday. Thank you all for attending today's webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank, thank you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you, Chidima. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.